can go to too many churches in this town or anywhere and get somebody to play the piano like John does. We are surely blessed. Hey, if there's anybody that like to come up and join me, you know you're more than welcome. You got the riser, you come and stand on it or stand with me. But let's open up to number 219. Just a great song. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place.
John a whole lot more than me, but they seem like they're new, but they're not. They've been around for 50 years or more. We just have to do them a little more often. We do them every week. Guess what? We got them all. But let's do we bring the sacrifice of praise. It's going to move. We repeat it, so we'll be doing it twice today. There we go. chapter 4, verses 7 through 16. 1 John chapter 4, 7 through 16. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed His love among us. He sent His one and only Son into the world that we might live through Him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. But if we love one another, God lives in us, and His love is made complete in us. We know that we live in Him, and He in us, because He has given us of His Spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent His Son to be the Savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in Him and He in God. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in Him. This bread represents the body of Christ. Remember him as we eat together. This drink represents the blood that Jesus shed for the sins of the world. Remember him as we drink together. 
Before we take up our offering, I'd like to read once again from the book of 1 John. From 1 John chapter 3, verses 16 through 18. 1 John chapter 3, 16 through 18. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down His life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? Dear children, let us not love with words or tongue, but with actions and in truth. Amen. Psalm chapter 106 verses 1 through 4. Praise the Lord. Give the thanks to the Lord for He is good. His love endures forever. Who can proclaim the mighty acts of the Lord or fully declare His praise? Blessed are they who maintain justice, who constantly do what is right. Remember me, O Lord, when you show favor to your people. Come to my aid when you save me. Ted, thank you, John, for playing today. I was talking with the girls a few minutes ago, and they said they had a good time at the Christian camp this week. We're glad to have them back here with us today. I know it's a lot of fun going down to the camp. We ran a lot of good people down there, so uh, couldn't find a better place to go. We're glad you had a good time. You might have noticed, some of you noticed that this paper is a little bit thicker than, than it usually is. Let me assure you, it is the thickest paper that I can run through that copier downstairs. That is it. You have to stand there and punch it one at a time. You don't want to set it on 20 or 25 or 30 and let it go because it's going to jam for, at the first opportunity. So if you get a chance, read the little story in there. I always hope that that brings a, a smile to your face. Uh, and I marked a couple of things from that because on the back of your bulletin, I had started putting, or sometimes on the inside, experience the presence. And we're seeing the presence of the Lord is surely in this place. And that's what we should all strive to have here, is the presence of the Lord here among us today. And we can have His presence anywhere we are. We know that. 
But there should be something that we feel when we come from the outside to the inside or from the downstairs to the upstairs. We should feel a closer presence to Him. And that's what all of us can strive for here is to have everyone experience the presence. And in that little story there uh, about dogs, uh, His presence is mentioned uh, about three times. There's one there where it says His presence, and then another one, His presence, and then finally, it says, your presence. And so that's what we want to happen here, is the presence of the Lord. And you can take that with you throughout the week. It's good to have Ted back with us today. He was a little under the weather last week, so it's good to have him back and leading us in our prayer request. Thankfully, got a little a little rain today, maybe just enough to water the flowers. I was talking with Raleigh earlier. Maybe it watered the flowers that here. That's about that's about all we got in it. But uh, any rain uh, is welcome rain. And I was surprised to see John uh, back with us today. Kelly is not here. Uh, we don't uh, want to point that out. But uh, that might be because of the uh, little cartoon in the bulletin last week, if you remember that cartoon, you know, uh, well, of uh, John in his pool down there. Some of you saw that. Some of you weren't here. Uh, and then, of course, his uh, lifeguard, the, uh, the little mouse. And so I was surprised John was here because he was enraged at me when he left here. I mean, just, I mean, just almost attacked me uh, verbally. Uh, but, uh, and I'm still apologizing to him. Well, maybe this will cheer us all up today, okay? Now, I've, I've done this, quote, message, if you want to call it that. Uh, about a year ago, I did. It seems like I did it maybe even a year before that. So it's, maybe it's time to do it again. And some of you uh, have asked about it. And uh, so for those of you that have heard this message, uh, it's just a review for you. And for those of you that haven't heard it, well, that's great. And you can just sit back and go, isn't that wonderful? Because uh, these are not my words. Uh, this is a message straight from Billy Graham. Uh, and it's about the uh, Heaven Answer Book that he wrote some years ago. The Heaven Answer Book. Because people have questions about heaven, don't they? I dare say none of us here have been to heaven and come back. I don't see any hands. But we get asked about heaven. What is heaven? Where is it? Who's going to go there? And one of the Bible's greatest truths, and we're saying the word truth, it reminds me of what I put on the lower side of the church sign. The truth is out there. You have to search for it. Now maybe that's a homage to the X-Files that I used to watch years ago. But... Isn't that true? The truth is out there. You just have to know where you're searching. And you have to know uh, who you're listening to. But one of the Bible's greatest truths is that we were not meant for this world alone. We were meant for heaven. Now again, these words are not mine. These words are Billy Graham's. Because heaven is our ultimate home. This is a temporary home. But what? exactly is heaven. What's it like? Is heaven something that only affects our future? Or should heaven make a difference in the way we live right now? Well, God has revealed some of the answers to our questions in the Bible. That's our only source uh, of uh, authority about heaven, really, is what's in the Bible. So the first question, or one of the questions that people ask is, does the Bible say very much about heaven? Well, Jesus mentions heaven about 70 times in the book of Matthew alone. 70 times just in the book of Matthew. It appears from the very verse that we read, the first verse in Genesis, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And it appears in the last reference 
found at the end of Revelation. So from the beginning to the end of the book, to the books of the Bible, in Revelation, it says, He showed me the great city descending out of heaven, descending out of heaven from God. Fifty-four of the sixty-six books in the Bible mention heaven. Once again, people ask, what is heaven? We have our own ideas about what it is or what it could be, but what is heaven? <clears throat> well, Billy Graham, from his research and experience, time in this world, he said that heaven is the place where God dwells. So first and foremost, heaven is the place where God dwells. God created heaven. He lives in heaven. And someday, all believers will live in heaven. Moses prayed that God would look down from heaven your holy dwelling place. Now that's in the book of Deuteronomy. God would look down from heaven his holy dwelling place. Solomon, the wisest king who ever lived, prayed, O Lord my God, hear from heaven your dwelling place. So, referenced again as his dwelling place. Abraham said, God most high, creator of heaven. Nehemiah prayed to the God of heaven. King Nebuchadnezzar praised the God and the King of heaven. And what did Jesus pray when his disciples asked him, would you teach us to pray, Jesus? What did Jesus say? What did he pray? Our Father, which art in where? In heaven. So heaven is occupied by the presence of God. First and foremost, that is God's dwelling place. He is there. He can be other places. But God lives in His dwelling place of heaven. And so people many times will ask this question, is heaven a literal place or simply a dream? Or is it a state of mind? Is it a literal, physical, tangible place, something we can touch or do we just live it in our mind? Billy Graham says heaven is a literal place. It's a real place. It's not an imaginary world. It's not a fantasy land. God created heaven. Jesus did not ascend to a dream world following his resurrection. He went to a real place. He returned to sit at the right hand of the Father, as it says in the Bible. So he returned to the place in which he had come. Jesus told his disciples, this is from John chapter 14, you know the place, you know the way to where I'm going. You know the way and you know the place where I'm going. And that place for Jesus was heaven. And Jesus is there right now preparing for our arrival, whatever that time might be. He's there, sitting at the right hand of the Father, preparing a place for us, as it says in the Bible, Heaven has many rooms that can accommodate all of us. Many rooms, physical location. It's a real place. It's literal. It's tangible, touchable. People ask, well, what will we see when we get to heaven? I'd say wonderful, glorious things. And that's not Billy Graham saying that. That's well, actually, he says we will see many glorious sights in heaven. But the most wonderful sight of all will be the Savior of the world. We will see Him. We will see Him. We will see His glory. In the book of Isaiah, it says, Your eyes will see the king in his beauty and view a land that stretches afar. So we will see Jesus and we will see this land that stretches afar. And Jesus gave us a glimpse of this land when he pulled back the curtain of heaven and told the apostle John to write down what he saw. And John wrote, Then I saw a lamb. I heard every creature in heaven singing. And they were singing this. 
To Him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. That's from the book of Revelation. And he goes on to say that human language falls short of describing such beauty, such majesty. We don't have the, the words in our human vocabulary to really describe what heaven is going to be like. So John, in writing about heaven, could only put it this way. In, in some analogies, he wrote, Its brilliance was like that of a very precious jewel, like jasper, clear as crystal. The great street of the city was of pure gold, like transparent glass. Here on earth, streets are covered with gravel, asphalt, windows are made of glass, but John writes about the golden streets that are transparent. Now that's the best John could write. Maybe something we could relate to. Can you imagine what it's really going to look like? These streets. Once again, making reference to something we know about. Streets. Water. All these things that we know exist, those things exist in heaven only on a different level. Now for many of us, this is always a question we'd like to have answered. Will there be animals in heaven? And Billy Graham says, while the Bible does not specifically answer this question, no one can miss God's work in the animal kingdom. His written word, the Bible, provides us with a snapshot of his handiwork. This is from Genesis. Let the earth bring forth the living creature according to its kind. Cattle and everything on the earth. And God saw that it was good. So he doesn't answer it specifically, but also paraphrasing Billy Graham. He goes on to talk about this. Will man's best friend, whatever man's best friend might be, we sometimes associate that biasly uh, with dogs. But it could be a cat, it could be a pet of whatever choosing you have. So Billy Graham says, we talk about man's best friend because a faithful dog, now this is him talking here, a faithful dog will protect its owner at all costs. He goes on to say that fish are a source of food for many of us. We love to envision Jesus when he was on the shore and he was broiling those fish. You remember that? He invited the disciples to have something to eat with him, so we envision that. Think about Jesus riding into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey colt. In Revelation, we know that his appearance one day will be on a white horse from heaven, as it says, Revelation 19.11. Scripture goes on to speak of the future kingdom when, as it says, the wolf will live with the lamb, the leopard will lie down with the goat, the calf and the lion and the yearling together, and a little child will lead them. Isn't that beautiful? Perfect peace will reign. Everything that has breath, including <coughs> animals, will praise Him. As it said, the creatures were all singing. Even the animals will praise Him. And digressing for a moment, Billy Graham was asked about that, and he put it another way when someone said, will our pets be in heaven? And he said that to him, or for him, it wouldn't be heaven without his pets being there. So think of all those pets that you've had throughout your lifetime. Think of all. Think of one day all those pets being there. That'd be something. Yeah, what a day. 
Now, people ask, well, heaven be somber and serious? It's a valid question. I think most of us can answer that. Uh, no, it won't be. But some people ask, is it somber? Is it serious? You know, kind of like church. You know, when we're somber, we're serious, we never have any fun. That's just a little joke. <laughs> Very little. Uh, but will heaven be somber and serious? The Bible says that joy will be the heavenly mood. That's from the book of Romans. And joy being a theme in the Bible, that theme is referenced in Scripture nearly 200 times. So joy will reign in heaven. The Bible says the kingdom of God is a place of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. When Jesus was on earth, He said that He would give us His joy. That's from John 15. And that joy would be complete and never be taken away. So Jesus would not give us something so wonderful as His joy on earth and then take it away in heaven. That would seem absurd, wouldn't it? Now I added that last little bit. Billy Graham didn't say anything about being absurd. But if we have joy here on earth, if Jesus came to make our joy complete, it wouldn't be taken away once we get to heaven. And in the book of Isaiah, one of the promises of God, promises of God, he said, my people will receive a double portion and everlasting joy will be theirs. There it is. Joy. One of the questions that people ask, will we see people in heaven that we couldn't get along with on earth? I see some of you smiling because I'm, I'm smiling and chuckling at that as well. But will we see people in heaven that we just simply cannot get along with on earth? Well, Billy Graham says, we'll not only see them, but we'll get along with them perfectly. In heaven, the past will be forgiven. They will be perfect. And so will we. God's forgiveness means the complete blotting out of the dirt of our past, of our present, and of our future. Now we know that some people just naturally rub us the wrong way. Just as we rub some people the wrong way. But how will we feel when we meet those people in heaven? Well, Paul reminds us that, as he puts it, in a flash, we will be changed. That's 1 Corinthians 15. We will be changed. We will be perfect. We will no longer hold grudges or dislike someone we will all be in perfect love, those that are there. Now, some of you might be thinking, well, uh, surely some of those people will not be there. Well, they, they might not be there. Maybe those people are not believers. Maybe they won't be in heaven. But for those that are, and even those that we didn't get along with here on this earth, they're going to be there, and we're going to love them. I think that would be a great day. I really do. To love those people that maybe we just didn't love while we were on this earth. I think that would be a great day. Now here's a question some people ask. Do the angels have anything to do with our lives right now? Well, I think most of you say yes. Billy Graham goes on to say here, although they are largely unseen, Angels are constantly at work on our behalf. The Bible calls them, this is in the book of Hebrews, the Bible calls them ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation. So angels are among us. Scripture documents angelic visitations, times when they did become visible, saying they appeared with glorious radiance, being recognized immediately as angelic beings. But at other times, they were not recognized as angels. 
because they appeared in human form. The Bible says, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 2, some people have entertained angels without knowing it. I think we all like that verse. I like that verse. That we've all, or many of us, have entertained angels without knowing it. I think that should be comforting to us. God Himself sends those angels to us. And in Psalm 91, verse 11, it says, He, God, will command His angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. And then finally, if heaven is real, what difference should it make in our lives right now? Knowing that heaven is real and that we will go there someday, that should make a great difference in the way we live today. Because heaven gives us hope. Hope for today, hope for the future. No matter what we're facing, we know it is only temporary. And ahead of us is heaven. The Bible says, 2 Corinthians, though outwardly we are wasting away, our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. This is our temporary home. Our final resting place, workplace, home place, is heaven. And so let us all remember that heaven is a real, literal place. And that one day, all of us will be there. I love, that's uh, just part of that book. Uh, if you ever want to get a copy of it, I think we have one downstairs, but it's the Heaven Answer Book by Billy Graham. And there's plenty of those uh, type books out there. That just happens to be uh, one that I like. We're going to have an invitation hymn this morning. Bob's going to lead us. John's going to play. Maybe you haven't put your hope in Jesus. And so today might be the day you want to do that. Our invitation hymn this morning will be number 482. Jesus is calling. And if you will, let's stand together again. so desperately needed. Well, our closing hymn this morning could have been uh, an invitation song. It could have been any of the above. There's something about that name, number 83. <coughs> but before we sing it, uh, join me in a closing prayer. Jesus, we thank you for everything you put up on each and every one of us. But when we get down to it, love is the answer to everything. We need to share love with each other and with the world. Give us the strength and guidance to share that love, Lord. In your name we all pray. Amen.
Thank you.